All right, so today we're going to be talking about the endless aisle. Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of an introduction um, around Varilla. Um, for those of you, I'm hoping most of you know that we do make pasta and sauce, but some of you may not know that we actually have a really large presence in Europe. Uh, we sell bakery products, which is breads and crackers, as well as crisp breads. So we are a leader globally, um, and we are also still owned and managed by the Barilla Brothers, which of course um, makes it very interesting as they are part of, they are in Italy, they're very, very um, protective of their brand. And I'll get into how that impacts us in just a little bit. Next, Bill will talk about Shopkick and then he'll get into uh, our agenda for today. Great, thank you, Debbie. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, we have a big room. It's feeling like a bit of an endless aisle. Uh, so we'll go out and reach out to all of you um, today, I think, with really, really good content. So I'm CEO of Shopkick. And Shopkick, in many respects, is a digital overlay to the physical world of shopping. You heard Doug Stevens talk earlier today about measuring stores and measuring retail like you would web web Oh, your web presence, and I think Shopkick really enables uh, retailers and brands to be able to do that. Um, we are an ecosystem of consumers, of retailers, and brands. For the consumers, we focus on, like Doug Stevens talked about experiences, we focus on moments of joy for that consumer and how to create rewarding experiences. That reward can be monetary, that reward could also be social engagement and making shopping fun. For retailers, we focus on incentives to drive people into stores. And for brands, rather than focusing on a small conversion rate for digital advertising, we focus on putting products in the hands of users. And our model is really interesting because it's very much focused on pay for performance, that you are only pay if we complete an action, get somebody into a store, holding a product, uploading a receipt, and so forth. Um, so in terms of what we're going to be able to cover today, our focus is going to be on expanding what that definition of the endless aisle is. Traditionally, it's been one focused on inventory strategy, and our focus really is expanding that definition to be anytime, anywhere commerce. So we'll talk a little bit about that both online and offline and, and what we do. We're focusing on creating an, an uh, endless aisle strategy. So a lot of that, of course, always starts with the consumer, understanding what that consumer wants, figuring out what those experiences or moments of joy of that consumer is so that we can reach them at the right time, at the right place, in the right context to create that moment of joy and ultimately, of course, convert that into a sale. And how to do that is being able to find those right solutions. We're also going to talk about a little bit about internal organization, right? That we want organizations that are going to succeed like Barilla are focusing on not just having a traditional departmental approach, but having much more holistic view of what that consumer looks like. So we'll hear a great success story uh, from Debbie around Barilla and the introduction of the Pronto Pasta brand. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some future innovation concepts things like computer vision, conversational in, uh, interfaces, and sentiment analysis. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, here we have, the obviously, the endless aisle. And what we're focusing on, again, is moving from that traditional inventory perspective to one that's very much focused on anytime, anywhere commerce. And ultimately, how do we reach that consumer um, at the right place, at the right time, and really engage uh, and find the right solutions for them uh, to go ahead and, and move, uh, move forward, move forward your business and engage with them in the right, in the right sort of way. Historically, uh, the endless aisle has been go into a store, and if there's items that are not there, there's a kiosk that's available, right? So one way this works really well, of course, is in retail, where you're looking to buy uh, Clothes, clothes are not there, and you're able to connect with that kiosk to expand that shopping experience into finding items that are not available on that aisle. Obviously, what worked well in the past doesn't work as well today in this world of mobile commerce, where people obviously expect something, uh, something much, much more. So our focus then is being able to reach this set of users uh, anytime, anywhere, as we've talked about today. 
So the world is a much more complex place than it was, let's say, for a marketer 50 years ago. Right, 50 years ago, uh, you could be a, a marketer, and if you wanted to reach a third of the country, you advertise on a show like I Love Lucy, and you know, your job is done. But today we live in a highly fragmented uh, world where attention spans are a lot shorter, people are on the go, people are obsessed with their mobile experiences, as, as you can see um, on the screen, and, and, but the job of the marketer is ultimately the same, is how to create a connection, an emotional connection between the consumer and your brand and between the retailer and that consumer as well. Um, so, yeah. So um, the challenge then internally is that um, historically companies have, or brands have, and retailers have been focused on budgets, or departmental budgets, right? There's the commerce budget, the shopper marketing budget, the promotion bar, uh, bucket and so forth. And in a world like I Love Lucy, of course that works because it's very easy to reach a large audience at a single moment. But in today's world, with the advent of presence technology, location technology, um, mobile technology, of course, and with, with the average person, I think, in the United States now having five devices, um, it is impossible to reach a large audience at a, at a single moment in time. And the way to be successful ultimately is to have a holistic view of wh where that customer is. Um, and that holistic view then needs to incorporate all of these elements to really reach that, that consumer with the right offer at the right time, in the right context, on the right place, on, in the right device, and so forth. And so you don't want to want your marketing departments to be like Django where things are are unstably stitched together, and, and if a single thing goes wrong in the plan, ultimately you don't reach that consumer at the right moment. So there are literally thousands of solutions. This is a real chart. There are literally thousands of solutions that are available to marketers, and it's something that becomes very overwhelming, right? So the first thing is, is from a marketing perspective, is you have to spend time and take time out to invest in what are the potential solutions out there that are gonna ultimately be able to work for you. And then, and then from that, um, big, figure out what the right approach is in terms of the experience, the engagement, the content, and the tools that you're ultimately gonna use. So spending time on this, uh-oh, is, uh, is something that is uh, really important. Um, the question then becomes is how effective is, is digital marketing today, right? So one thing we know is there was a study done by Cadence. So one thing we know is that from a CPG perspective, uh, there's a lot going on in digital advertising. Digital advertising spend in that sector is actually increasing, but its effectiveness is actually not matching the spend that is out there today from a digital advertising perspective. There was a study by an organization called Cadence that found that from digital advertising, only 14% of shoppers are aware of brands digital ads and only 10% of those folks were actually influenced um, by those ads. So, and what we're also finding is that even traditional advertising or in-store promotion, coupons and those other types of promotions are actually be, are more effective. So there needs to be an approach that's more effective, right, than the classic digital advertising approach that we have today. So one thing we're focused on, going back to finding the right solutions, which all starts with understanding your consumer, is at Shopkick, we have our headquarters in San Francisco and a very large office here in, in New York City, is, to, is a lot of our user group work is actually done in cities outside these bubble areas, right? And so one aspect, one, one uh, example is here in Houston. And one thing we learned through our research and understanding consumers is given the audiences are fragmented, how do you catch, catch that user at the right moment in time? So one of the things we're focused on at Shopkick, right, is to understand that in co entire consumer path to purchase. And that's everything from what you do on the couch when you're doing, figuring out where you're gonna do, do your shopping the next day, to going into the store, to also capturing that idle moments in time. And so there's a really good example here as an example from Janet from Houston where we're gonna play a short clip to say how does she wanna use her idle time? 
How, how do you interact in social media? What does, a, what does one of your consumers do while they're waiting to pick up their kids from school? So this is a, a really good little good audio if clip. If I have 15 minutes before I pick Sophie up for preschool, I can either sit in my car and look at Facebook, or I can go to Kroger and run around and scan, scan, scan. And I was like, even if it only, you know, that one shopping trip adds up to two bucks, it's two bucks. And the next time I go to the grocery store and she wants a little toy, guess what? That's, you just paid for that stupid little $2 toy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Versus me looking at Facebook or shopping. Yeah. So th this is a really good example. We love this, of course, because rather than being on Facebook, uh, in this case, Janet prefers to be on Shopkick. But it also talks to the, the notion that, that typically, uh, you know, low prices only don't usually work, that consumers are looking for engagement and activity and finding a way to save money. And in this case, Janet actually says, I rather, not, rather than be on Facebook, I rather find a way to save money for my family and be engaged in, in this overall shopping process. So ultimately, what's a marketer to do? There are many challenges out there. We've talked about some solutions. We've talked about in internal and organizational challenges that you may face uh, from time to time. So now let's turn it over to Debbie and learn more. Okay, thank you. All right, so a little background on um, the situation at Barilla. So um, we do know that one of the barriers to purchasing pasta is convenience. There are a group of people out there who feel like boiling water is too much work. And so we acknowledge that and in 2015 came out with this product called Pronto. And Pronto is a wonderful product. You put the, the pasta in a pan, you put three cups of cold water in, you turn on the heat in 10 minutes, it is cooked and um, the water has absorbed. You don't need to drain it. And when you explain this to somebody, especially a younger, less experienced cook, or um, typically a mom who's trying to do many, many things, they say, oh my gosh, wonderful. I don't have to drain the product, it's all in one pan, love it. Problem is, I can't go talk to every consumer in the US, right? So we were really definitely facing an issue where there was um, this product needed education and uh, we needed to find a way to educate and let people know about the product. Additionally, I had mentioned to you that um, a lot of our marketing activity is still monitored and somewhat managed by Italy. And um, because they are quite protective of the brand, their philosophy is that they want all packaging to look like Barilla. Well, that's wonderful except for the fact that when you're trying to introduce a new product that needs a lot of education, this product just looks like another pasta product. It does not stand out on the shelf. So we had a real issue in terms of awareness, even at, at shelf. Um, so when our friends at Inn brought us this idea for, from Shopkick, where we could actually educate people pre-shop and get them to engage in store, I thought this was uh, for sure a home run that we would want to test. Now, Bill had talked about organizational si silos, and I actually, I, I did run into that um, at Barilla when I introduced this idea, because um, this is not a typical shopper marketing program, and so, you know, should this be done by shopper? Should this be done by digital? Maybe it's a CP activity. So there is actually a lot of time going back and forth organizationally to see how should we use this product, the Shopkick product, product in order to help Pronto. So we, we ended up working through all of that, doing a little negotiation back and forth. And so we decided that we would be launching um, our program in the fourth quarter. Now, most of you know, fourth quarter tends to be a, a tad crazy. Um, but we actually wanted to take advantage of the craziness out there and see if, again, kind of testing this new concept, could we break through the clutter during, that's going on during this time period and get people's attention. Um, from, a, from a PASA standpoint, we don't typically, we'll, we'll do some trade promotions, um, of course, 
in the, the November, December time period, but you know, I can't get displays out there. Even if we get the merchant to agree to a display, it's not gonna get put up there based off of the store owner. So we have typically stayed away from that crazy November, December time period. Um, and so again, this was part of that test to see if, if we're thinking about things completely differently anyway, let's think about them completely differently. So again, what I really liked about this idea um, that Shopkick provided is the fact that we are able to educate people up front. We're able to make that, that awareness, show them how it works, because again, that was for Pronto specifically, that was part of the problem. They really didn't get what it could do. So we were able to, when they were ready to engage, to start thinking about their meal planning, they were able to understand and get some more information about what Pronto does. Then the next step is rewarding them for going into a store. And not only going into a store, but then engaging at shelf. They get points, they get rewarded for picking up the product and scanning the product. And then ideally, purchasing the product. And so that was kind of the whole test of this, is to see if we could educate them and get them to engage with the product at the shelf, what are we gonna see in terms of results? And I will tell you our overall results were phenomenal. It was way beyond anything I had expected. We had a, over a 30% engagement or conversion rate. Very importantly, two thirds of the people on Shopkick found out about Pronto because of this program. So it was definitely doing, doing its job in terms of driving awareness. And then we had some um, extra heavy up activity at Walmart and our sales at Walmart during this time period um, was incredibly strong, way stronger than it was for the, some of the um, retailers that did not get the program. So we were super happy about the overall result. Um, one of the other things I had done was I, I also tested uh, this pro the Shopkick project product um, on our Protein Plus. Another product that, that requires a little bit of education because it's, um, it's, it's made with different products to um, provide some protein. But I, in, instead of doing the entire journey, um, we, we focused on a, a smaller part of the Shopkick tools. And while the, this part of the program did quite well, it did not do as well as, the, as Pronto. The overall conversion rates were not as strong. And so it really showed me that that whole education and that driving awareness and inspiration up front really made a difference. And again, you, you saw the video earlier, but that showing them quickly how to use it, getting some recipe ideas in their head, because another thing that we know is that millennials do shop based off of a recipe. They're not planning out a meal's worth of activity they are thinking about recipes and going into the store and buying that recipe at that point in time. And we had great results from the video um, with a completion rate well above industry standards. And so when we looked at who actually engaged at shelf, we had a much stronger engagement rate at shelf when the shopper use the different tools from Shopkick in terms of ways of finding out about Pronto. And so again, when you guys are thinking about, you know, how do you market your, your brands and how do you engage your consumers, think about all of those touch points because those touch points, as you can see here, really are important for getting that final engagement at shelf. So we, you saw great conversion, you saw great engagement, you saw great awareness. This actually is my favorite slide. And it's my favorite slide because this consumer, you saw Bill already talk about the fact that they do uh, focus groups and they learn about how people think about shopping and what they do in those 10 minute increments when they've got a chance to have a minute of downtime. And so they were doing a focus group and this woman brought up 
pronto. The fact that she found pronto through this program and it has made her life easier. And the reason I love this is because we as marketers typically see the sales results or the click-through rates and things like that. We don't get to hear a consumer tell us that we made their meal times easier. And so I think that I have a loyal consumer now and that is why this is my favorite slide. So, you know, when I think back on this program, what I really love is the fact that we were able to impact the entire path to purchase. We got her to be aware of the product. We got her to think about going into the retail store. We had her go down the aisle, and then we had her pick up Pronto and scan it and then purchase it. And that entire path to purchase really helped engage these people. And again, for some of the retailers, we saw the highest sales across the year during this program. And remember, this was crazy Black Friday and all of that time period. So we were able to break through the clutter in a way that was meaningful to her in order to get these results. So as part of my role um, at Barilla, I oversee marketing services, consumer uh, promotions, shopper marketing. And so I'm able to see a, a kind of a broader range of um, the different tactics that work. And one of the things that we're really trying to do is get the entire department, one, to be thinking about the shopper journey. Um, because if we're just focusing on our little piece of the world, we're not gonna have that overall impact that's as strong as it could be. So we're starting to talk about what is that journey, what is it that we, we want people to do. I have actually, in, in my team's PDPs, their, their performance, I have um, made everybody put in a test and learn so that they make sure that they are constantly on the lookout, learning about new tools that are available. I think probably everybody heard this last couple days how the shopper behavior is changing, it's continuing to grow, what worked a year ago some, in some cases no longer works. So we really need to, as marketers, be aware of how to contact the shoppers. What are they doing in those 10 minute increments? How do you engage them when they're ready to be engaged? Whether it's a fast trip, if it's a slow trip, do I have browsing time, do I not have browsing time? So I would encourage all of you to think about you know, having your kind of test and learn budget or at least some spirit of testing and learning even if something fails because you, you learn a lot from that as well. So as you guys start to think about, you know, how do you put this into action, really understand your consumer. Uh, we were lucky enough that we've done a lot of work in terms of both path to purchase a uh, lot of uh, brand work. So we understood what the barriers were. We understood what the, the triggers were. We understood how she behaves as she goes through that path to purchase. So we started to craft a vision of what do we want that experience to be? What is that next step? How do we get her from point A to B to C all the way through to purchase? And then once we had that, how do you bring the, this to life? And in some ways, this is the hardest part, right? Because you have to work across the cross-functional team. You have to make sure that sales knows how to explain to the retailers what we're doing that's different and how it's gonna help their business. You have to explain to the brand teams, hey, this is not this rogue thing. We are actually impacting your consumer because we are engaging them up front with some information and learning about their, your product and then getting them all the way through to, to retail. So that part, hard, but very, very important. So Bill's gonna talk about some trends that he has seen um, coming up and what, where he thinks the future's going, and then I'll close. Great. Thanks, Debbie. Um, so there are a few areas that we're looking at as we build actually, as a technology company, build out our product roadmap towards what we call our 2020 vision. So we wanted to share um, a little bit of that with you. Uh, so the first area is really cool is computer vision. 
And you may be familiar with computer vision because if you hear about self-driving cars, self-driving cars in, in, in part incorporate computer vision. Today, of course, those are not working as well as they will potentially in the future because they have trouble differentiating, let's say, from a small piece of paper in the road, versus, which is not a problem if you're driving, to a bigger rock in the road, which may in fact be a problem. But these same sorts of ideas, you may begin seeing elements of this on shopping carts at, at some upscale supermarkets. But the ability is to, un the, the focus here is to understand what that user is actually doing and be able to provide some level of insight into uh, the consumer, what it is they're buying, what it is they want to buy, what it is they would explore on the shelf but put back versus something they would buy and the data collection that's available with computer vision in store and in supermarket is something that would provide very valuable consumer insights for retailers and brands. So computer vision is an area that we think is going to be not just for self-driving cars, but something we're going to be seeing in store uh, it, as we close out the decade. Mom, we're adding milk. Adding milk to shopping list. So another key area from, a, from a, a technology standpoint is lots of inputs today are done right through a, a mouse click or hitting something on the keyboard. But obviously conversational interfaces are, are definitely the future. We're seeing some of that today, obviously with Apple Siri and Amazon Echo and other Google Home and other devices like that. So we imagine a world where um, it's not just entering something on the shopping list, either by hand or, or through some sort of mobile app, but the ability to say, hey, we're out of, we're out of milk, and immediately whatever conversational interface uh, uh, technology is nearby is able to actually record that, either add it to a shopping list or actually go ahead and actually order that for you in some way, whether that is at home or potentially actually in store. So the future, not just in the world of retail and brand, but in terms of interacting with technology is clearly going to be voice. Um, we're beginning to see that now, but clearly it's gonna be a major trend uh, as we approach 2020. And the last one where there actually is some work happening today from a retail uh, perspective is something called sentiment analysis. So to understand your consumer, right, and we hear lots of times as I'm out visiting customers, it's not even so much demographic information anymore, but is what is their behavior? What is their purchase behavior? What is it they actually are, are feeling as they interact with a brand or go into a store? Are they glad? Are they mad? Are they sad? Are they fearful? Are they excited? Are they bored? Are they frustrated? really understanding that sentiment as, as a real core piece of data and attribute for you to understand your consumer and build plans to help you in, help your brand or your store engage better with users is another trend that we're seeing um, that are approaching towards the end of the decade and something we're going to be investing, investing in as well in terms of exploring and potentially building products around. So those are three, three key trends we see, computer vision, conversational interfaces, and again, using computer technology to figure out what the sentiment is of your target user or prospect. So with that, I'm gonna call Debbie back up here and to give a summary of what did we learn here over the last 40 minutes or so. Thank you, Bill. Okay, so, you know, listening to Bill, basic needs have not changed. It is the way that the consumer is going to get to those needs and satisfy those needs that is changing. And so this idea of the endless aisle, I think is really interesting and really important because it is, again, this, this micro moment, the, the, the thinking, the feeling, uh, tapping into all of that, that is really going to change the way we go to business. Um, I think probably most of you are into 2018 planning and so, Again, I encourage you to really think through what are those experiences that you want your consumer shopper to have? What is it that you're trying to get them to know, to think, to feel? Plan that out first before you send the digital team off to do something and the, the TV team to do something and the brand teams are gonna do something. Think through that whole experience and try to get your organization then to own different pieces of that experience so that it comes together seamlessly rather than 
having to fight through whose budget it needs to, to work through. Keep it fun. Find new ways of engaging. Um, I think that this is a really important element because there's so much out there now and it can get so overwhelming. But again, if you're thinking about, hey, this is what I want them to think and feel, go find some fun ways to do that. You can keep some of the standard stuff, keep doing your FSIs, all of that, but, but look for some of those really neat little nuggets that make it interesting. And then what we learned was, you know, in that period that we typically would not have gone to retail to ask for um, any kind of a promotion, we didn't need to because we found a tool that even though we didn't have a display or anything else extra going on, she still engaged at that retailer, at the shelf, picking up the product. And so we were able to kind of break through the clutter in a period that we would not typically ha have done a big promotion in. So those are our kind of our key learnings. Um, and I think we can probably open it up for Q&A. Yeah. Thank, thank our speakers, excellent. <laughs> So uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, remember the Pathable uh, site to, to log in your feedback. Again, very valuable, helps, uh, helps the speakers. Uh, secondly, please, as I go around, wait for the mic to answer your question so the whole room can hear it. And if you would, just introduce yourself briefly with your name and who you're from would be great. Um, and I wanted to kick one off around, the, to start off the questions, around location. Because obviously you talked about that path and that journey and that aisle. Um, to talk a little bit about what you use today in terms of location and, and how you can use that to market to uh, the shopper with the right message and where and how to go about that and what do you see the future of that? Yes, yeah, so again, we think, uh, thanks for the question, we think presence detection is incredibly important to uh, both bring people into store but to begin to measure their engagement uh, within the store. So there's a variety of technologies, there is ultrasound technology, there's beacon technology, there is GPS technology and Wi-Fi technology, and depending on our relationship with our retailer or brands, because brands will also use our beacons at end caps to measure who goes by a particular item and then who scans and does not scan that item. So there's measurement for the brand as well as measurement on the retail side. And then as we begin exploring other technologies, there's things like uh, dead reckoning and literally our own magnetic field to be able to measure not where someone is maybe within a five or 10 foot radius, but ultimately to measure where somebody is within a one to two foot radius as well. So um, that is what we do today and what we're exploring for the future. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for sharing. I'm Bridget Allerton from Cow Brands, and we work a lot with Walmart. And I was wondering if you had any feedback from the retailer on the program, either with the location analysis or if they were really happy with the program. Just um, we'll let you start that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, great question. Um, overall, um, they have been really pleased with with the results. As I think I mentioned, um, it was one of the highest weeks. Um, of the year. So um, I, th I think we, while they know that there was a huge impact in sales, I think that we need to do a better job at Barilla with educating the, um, the sales team on some of the different things that we've done. So like they go in and they go, oh, shopper drove this. And that's about the extent of it, which is great. I'm glad that they know that we we've done something. But um, I would love to have a more engaged conversation with a lot of our buyers on here's what we're trying to do for you. Because I think that's really important because we take that into consideration as a shopper marketing team. We are thinking about what is it that that retailer is trying to accomplish and how do we get there? Um, so we need to improve that conversation. Hey, good morning. Scott Mueller with Marketing Lab. A um, couple of questions on the timing. How long was the campaign kind of in market? And did you refresh content 
and do you have some plans to uh, kind of how is the sustainability of the campaign kind of going forward? Okay, I, you know what? I knew that question was going to come up, and I wasn't prepared. Two months, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, <laughs> from In Marketing, saving my butt again. Um, it was a two-month program, um, and uh, we did not refresh the the content, but um, this was as you could see, quite successful. And so not only is it now a shopper program, it is a consumer promotions program. And so we are going to be, when it's the right situation for our brands, we are utilizing it more broadly um, in the organization. So, yes. Any other questions? There's a lot of interesting things. I'm also curious, you mentioned there was a lot of various departments, as you mentioned, working through how, how, a f and I imagine the program ended up as Shopper, how do you, s and now consumer promotions, how do you see that continuing to, uh, as it continues on? Because like you said, it's a type of program that can touch multiple disciplines, a little bit like the, the keynote this morning of, of how do we break through those various silos? What, what do you see as the, the best path forward? Yeah, I think, um I, again, I think that's why we, we are trying more and more to force that conversation internally around the journey and what are we trying to accomplish at each point so that then we can decide who's the rightful owner. Um, and, you know, one of my fatal flaws at, at work is I don't care, really care about the silos as long as we're getting things done. Um, and so, yes, that gets me into trouble sometimes, but I do think it forces a conversation that can be uncomfortable because, you know, it, we needed to go, to go back and forth. And um, specifically at Barilla, shopper is retail specific. We don't have a national shopper. So um, we needed to make this program, in order to get it kicked off, apply to several retailers. Um, and now, now we can get it more broad because we're, we're trying to do different uh, accomplish something different for the brand. So it, it goes back to what is it that you're trying to accomplish and what do you want the experience to be? Cool, thank you. Well, let's please thank our speakers for a great, uh, great start for the day.